Okay. Hey, this is Stefan Kinsella. Uh, this is Kinsella on Liberty. This is a, a rare, one of my rare podcast episodes where it's a ri- original content. Usually, as everyone knows, I just uh, do podcasts with other people and put them on my feed. That's the purpose of my feed, just to collect things. Every now and then I do an original interview. And uh, so today I've got one of my good buddies, Aaron Voisin. Is that Voisin, right? Voisin, it's Americanized. Voisin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's a fellow libertarian and bitcoiner and actually one of my smart friends um, you know i'm impressed by intelligence um, and so we have a private list and we've been arguing over something so i thought we would talk about it today and i'll get to that in a second but uh um today i'm trying my blue yeti for the first time i've had it for three or four years but i've never been able to get it to work right so i'm trying it now i've got the little shock stand that uh I've got my background. Anyway, I've got the shock scan because it was always making too much rumbly noise. But anyway, I'm trying this today. How's it sound, Aaron? Sounds pretty good. So yeah, how about me? I'm I, using my uh, MacBook Air laptop uh, microphone. How's that? Well, <laughs> I, I'm always annoyed by anyone who doesn't use a direct mic. I, I don't care if it's a cheap Uh-oh. earbuds, <laughs> but as long as you're close enough to it. Uh, do you have any earbuds you could put in? I can try them. Uh, they've been acting up. So tell me if they sound better or worse. Wireless or wired. I don't care. All right. Can you hear me okay? It might be the same, actually. You might have had, I don't know if you changed anything. Anyway, I can hear you okay. Um, so Is I'm going to lay out, um, say again, taste test. Worse. I can't tell. Well, we'll, we'll keep I, it this way. You sound like you're across, the, uh, across an air gap. Um, in other words, the laptop. Maybe just move, get get as close to it as you can. How about that? All right, that's fine. I think we'll we'll go with it uh, as long as I can hear my dulcet tones. <laughs> okay. So what we were talking about, uh, and usually I talk about libertarian theory and all this, and I am an amateur on Bitcoin, uh, and you and I both are interested in Bitcoin, but we both don't have any because we both lost ours in voting accidents, right? Yeah. Um. You're quiet for some reason. I don't know if that's working or not. Yep, I'm hearing silence. These, uh, these... Okay. How yeah, just that? check them Is out. That better? Yeah, yeah just... that's better. Okay, so here's my thing. I've been thinking about Bitcoin. Oh, now I'm hearing feedback. Okay, test, test. Fine. Okay, let's get going now. Um, one... So I'm, I'm enthusiastic about Bitcoin. You and I both are. Um, I'm hopeful of a world where Bitcoin is the only money and everything's better, right? But I always notice that the Bitcoiners seem to imagine that what this would look like would be – I have COVID right now, by the way, so I'm going to be pausing so I can cough. That's all my, – my final remaining <laughs> symptom is a cough, so I might hit the cough button on my, my Yeti. Are you making a joke or do you really have it? No, I have COVID right now. Oh, geez. We were just in uh, Juan and I were at Porkfest in New Hampshire, and um, oh, I see, and you caught it. There was an unvaccinated libertarian, a buddy of mine actually, who apparently spread it to lots of people. Uh, I don't know, over a dozen or something now. Um, so I noticed it when I got back home, and uh, I've been quarantining for the last uh, several days, and several more to go upstairs. So it's fine. It's like a staycation for me. I know people hate it. People hate it when you enjoy COVID. The lockdowns. I enjoyed COVID, uh, but to me, it's not a big problem. I'm in my movie room. I got my study. I got my balcony to smoke my pipe. My wife and son have been bringing me lunch, so you know, just waiting it out. Anyway, my symptoms haven't been bad, but I'm coughing every now and then. So, anyway, um, so here's the thing: the idea is that in, t- in today's society, because if you hold your savings in form of cash, it's always eroded by inflation. And so people are desperate to maintain their purchasing power or make a little gains, so they fly into riskier things like the stock market. So every all you, you know, average mom and pop keeps a lot of money in four hundred one ks and in IRAs, in in mutual funds and index funds and in stocks and bonds, um, in just a hope to maintain preserve the power the, the the purchasing power of their savings, right? 
And, and the Fed, like, uh, you know, intentionally tries to uh, create that situation and actually manage um, how quickly that happens, right, by, uh, you know, lowering interest rates and, and inflating, uh, you know, these, uh, these asset bubbles. Correct. Um, you know, when, there's, uh, when there's a downturn and things start going in the wrong direction, they, uh, they lower interest rates and, and uh, start trying to uh, print more money to reinflate these asset bubbles. And the way they do that is by, you know, convincing people to stop holding <laughs> dollars and, uh, right. and to, uh, you know, buy these assets instead because they're going up in value. And I agree with all that. And then, but, but so then the Austrians and the Bitcoiners say that, okay, well, so people have an artificial incentive now to not hold cash and to, to invest in riskier things that they don't have any business investing in because they're not really experts. And I kind of agree with that. So what happens is people start counting on the returns of the, of the stock market, which the, the government automatically artificially inflates, right, with policy. And then when there's a crash, everyone's screwed and they, their savings are wiped out. I mean, it's just, and then the government has to bail them out and the problem keeps compounding and getting worse and worse. So the idea is that <clears throat> in a sound money world, uh, your average investor wouldn't have that artificial – they wouldn't need to chase returns by investing in things they don't understand. So the idea is that the stock market would be left for professionals or something like that. And so then the picture that Bitcoiners seem to have is that you're, everyone or most people would just have their savings in cash. They would just hold their savings in cash. And that concern – go ahead. I, I was going to say I think there's like there's there's definitely like two um, types of uh, um, investing, right? There, there's speculation, right? Uh, which, uh, where you know you have stock traders who are trying to speculate in the market and trying to anticipate moves in the market, and they make money by you know obviously uh, buying low and selling high, and in doing so they raise the the low prices and they lower the high prices. Uh, by um, buying into one and selling into the other, and uh, they help you know flatten out the market. And uh, in doing that, they're they're you know that that is a specialized thing. And you know you wouldn't see, I think, if you in a hard money economy, um, the people who do that would be people who had special knowledge about um, you know future prices, maybe insider information or whatever, um, who could uh, help uh, you know reduce the volatility in the market. Um, and those people with special knowledge would be the ones who would make money, and those who didn't uh, would just be gambling, and they'd end up losing. I think. Right. So they're essentially getting paid because they have something that to, to add to the process by making the market more efficient by contributing their knowledge. Whereas your average mom and pop who just throws money at the at the um, at the at some index fund is just doing it. They don't know. They're, they're not adding anything, and so they're not adding us, information yeah. to the market. Yeah. Co correct. Um, so what troubles me about this idea is that first, and you and I debated about, or just disagreed about this. I thought, well, first of all, just because you can, so let, let's imagine. So you have your, you have a million dollars of savings, Bitcoin, that Bitcoin amount of that, like, and let's imagine Bitcoin's worth 10, 12 million bucks per coin. So we're talking about a 10th of a coin. So some guy saved up a 10th of a Bitcoin. Um, and every year, because global productivity keeps increasing and the number of people keeps going up, um, the number of goods and services expands every year. So it's bidding against a fixed number of Bitcoins. So every Bitcoin becomes more valuable. So the purchasing power of your Bitcoin that you hold goes up every year, let's say by 5%, something like that. So that's equivalent to a 5% return. If you just hold cash, your Bitcoin will buy more every year. Would you agree with that kind of way of putting it? Yeah, that's uh, assuming that the economy continues to grow and uh, you know technology keeps advancing and correct in productivity gains and, and or the population grows and so there's more uh, you know labor being added to the market that kind of thing. Um, assuming that the economy is growing, then you and you have a fixed amount of total total amount of Bitcoin, 21 million bitcoins. Then you have more and more goods and services chasing the same amount of, of Bitcoin. So the value in in relation to those goods and services of the Bitcoin is continually increasing in that in that scenario. Yeah, and so Bitcoiners say, okay, so everyone's going to get five percent returns automatically by holding cash, and that's quote good enough. So they wouldn't have an incentive to go invest in in IBM or Apple, or Amazon or or the index fund for this for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Um, and I'm thinking, well, that's just ridiculous. People are greedy. Uh, just because you can make five percent from cash, if you can make 7% or 10% or 12% in the market, you're going to do that. 
And then your counter was, well, that's impossible because you can't beat the market, especially if you don't have any extra knowledge, special knowledge, because the average profit of the Dow Jones or, 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 or capitalism in general or the stock market in general has to be the same as the deflation returns to Bitcoin because everything is denominated in terms of, of money. And I'm still wrapping my head around that, and I don't really want to argue too much about that, but th that was kind of one debate we had. So I'm thinking you could beat the market if you just put your money – in say the Dow, like a VTI or one of these index funds. So you, if you have a risk tolerance and you're willing to hold it for 20 years, certainly the stock market would beat the rate of deflation. And your argument is that that's wrong. Right. Because, um, you know, you still have, um, the only way that could work is if the stock market became a larger and larger proportion of the economy uh, over time. So like the, the ratio of the stock market to everything else in the economy would have to continually grow for the price of the stock market, like the total value of the stock market uh, as denominated in Bitcoin to continue to go up, right? There's, you got, uh, so like if there's a fixed amount of money and, that's, uh, and, the, and the stock market is a certain percentage of the economy, then the total value of the stock market as denominated in Bitcoin is going to stay the same. It's going to be roughly zero on average. Right, right. Um, and I can't quite see why you're wrong, but it seems wrong to me because if you're right, I can't understand what the purpose of the stock market is or why anyone would ever invest in anything. Like why wouldn't everyone just put everything in cash? But if everyone did that, we would have no investment and we would all die. So I can't understand where the balance would be reached and how that would work. You seem to think some people with specialized knowledge would invest. Like if I want to start a dry cleaning company or 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 or, or, or something like that, I would do it. But I, it I guess the question is what is by you think about the extremes, right? So if nobody invested, uh, then the economy wouldn't grow and correct. you wouldn't get any returns in Bitcoin. And uh, also, um, you know, anybody who did choose to invest, then like the beating the average rate of return would become easier. If nobody was investing and you had an investment opportunity, then it would be easier for you to, to beat that, that average. Return. I don't know, because by your argument, the average rate of return is denominated in terms of the money, and that can never be greater than the deflation. So I don't know. I mean, well, here's my... Here, so so it, it specifically in that situation, I think uh, what you would be seeing is that the the rate of uh, like um, like what I mentioned that the you know it's only zero if the ratio of the stock market to everything else in the economy stays the same. In that situation, you could actually grow the size of the stock market relative to everything else. Uh, mm. If if like okay, they're, they're, so while the stock market is growing. Um, right. But then when you when you when you level out, right, when you reach a, a steady state or, or some equilibrium point or something like that, it would not grow anymore. And at that point, the average returns. So so here's my here's my problem. Even if you assume mom and pop never do this because they know that they're going to be burned or they can't hope to beat the market. That seems to be true even for professionals. Even they can't beat the market on average. So why would anyone. You know, why would I put uh, if I have a million dollars saved? Why would I put it in my in my pizza business or my restaurant instead of just putting it in cash? Why can I hope to beat the market with with a particular investment? Well, so um, yeah, you'll you'll eventually if if the market is small enough, then any investment at all is going to you know cause the market to grow. And then once you hit that that equilibrium point, is where you have the same number of people who think they can beat the market. Uh, it, you know, the, the people who think they can beat the market and are willing to take that risk um, is going to equal the number of people who, you know, think they can beat the market and take the risk and fail, right? So there, there's going to be people who are uh, entrepreneurial and to invest and lose their investment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so on average, it's going to be zero, but uh, it, it'll be zero sum, but, uh, you know, people play zero sum games all the time. Right? But I guess if, 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 if the so-called professionals are willing to do that and play that game, knowing that on average, the house always wins, why wouldn't mom and pop do that too, to some degree? And, and they might, and mom and pop will probably lose their money to the professionals, right? And there's a sucker born every minute and the professionals will keep taking advantage of new people who think that they can, right. can, they can beat the market and, uh, you know, and, okay. and on average, it'll, it'll balance out.
So I still can't wrap my head around this because I'm just not good with these kind of numbers. But I, you may be right about all this. But the more interesting thing was a secondary thing. Okay, so here's the secondary thing. So I, I started thinking, well, so I'm, I'm imagining a future world, and it seems to me you don't need you don't need to, and you probably would not want to keep all of your wealth, your savings in cash, for a couple of reasons. Number one, because I, I think you could out, outperform the market, which you think you cannot. Uh, but also because without specialized knowledge, correct. <laughs> but the purpose of the purpose of cash is just to have li li liquidity on hand, right? So you don't need all of your wealth in cash for liquidity purposes. You just need enough for for spending regular needs on an annual basis or something like that, right? I, I would say that if you are producing more than you earn, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, producing more than you spend, rather, um, and you have excess income uh you need to put that somewhere you need to save it you need right. to put it either in an investment or in cash and you got to find a place to put it and uh, i think it will end up in cash when there aren't better places to put it no i know but what i'm saying is one reason to keep it in cash as opposed to other things is for the liquidity advantage but for that part you don't need it all to be there because you don't need all of your wealth to be liquid at all times and then the second, the second reason is to get some returns so that you don't lose to inflation or so. Well, of course, in a Bitcoin world, there wouldn't be inflation, but to have some returns. And you could get returns just by holding in cash, say five percent or whatever GDP or whatever the the relevant growth factor is that mirrors your the, the increase in your purchasing power every year. So five percent or something like that, right? Sure. Um, so, but, but I'm thinking that go you're going to consume some of it so like even even if it's going up in value correct um, like the, the the actual nominal number is going to decrease over time as you consume it correct so. you have to spend some but but um yeah. but, but the number, number is psychologically that number is always going down <laughs> you're right well maybe because you're saving because you're you're earning more than you um then you consume, so you have an excess, and that's what you have if to. You have income, yeah. Then if, if, if you have an income, you might not be. You might just be saving. But finally, when you retire, you're going to have a nest egg, and you need to use it. Although some Bitcoiners think you can always loan it out forever. I don't see how that works mathematically, but um, um, whatever. Um, but so here's my here's my here's my way of looking at it. Uh, as an Austrian of a certain type, um, I believe that. Uh, there are goods, and there are two types of goods, capital goods or, or producers' goods and consumer goods or consumption goods. And sure. th they're both different, but they have the same nature in that because it's a good, what that means is there's a stock, there's a stock of a supply, there's a supply of this good, and okay. the more of it, the better. That's what a good means. If you get to the point where you have too much of it, then it becomes a bad, like then you have pollution, you know, like you want some oil, but if it's, if it's your whole property is submerged in oil, then it's bad, <laughs> you know, sure. well, there, uh, there are costs associated with storing it. Right. So like, that, right. So at a certain point, the character of the good <laughs> as subjectively valued by the user changes from a good to a bad, but so long as it's a good and has a, has a, has a homogenous fungible uh, quantity uh, yeah. The more the more of it, the better. Although with marginal utility, the, every extra unit is worth less. Um, you know, the next diamond is worth less than the last. However, the more the better. The more the I, more I gold. Think oil is a great example. Like if you have oil reserves that are under the ground and easily accessible, um, the bigger they are, the better because they don't cost you anything to just let them sit there. And right. the more you have underground, the better. Correct. So the more so a good as a character, a good is a representative of wealth because the more of it you have, the better off you are, the more wealth we have in the world. But money is what some Austrians call a sui generis or a unique good because mm -hmm. it's not like consumer or capital goods because if you produce more of it, you don't increase wealth. I mean, this is just obvious. Uh, now, there is a, there is a, a wrinkle there because up until Bitcoin, most money was a useful commodity like gold or something else, and that itself has a non-monetary use. And so it is wealth for its non-monetary characteristics. So producing – increasing more of that good would increase wealth, but not because you increase the money. Um, and so if we say that the value of gold when it was money was predominantly the monetary aspect of it, then increasing its supply was kind of a waste. 
right? Like all the mining and all the minting and all that is a waste just to get more coins because when, when some guy finds gold and produces more gold, he's not producing more bananas or more clothing or more houses for people. He's just shifting resources from people that own it to himself. Not that it's illegitimate, but it's still not pre- increasing right. wealth. Would you agree with right. that? So like the, the monetary value, if you think about it, like the monetary value of all the gold doesn't come from like some, uh, you know, uh, it's like intrinsic value of Correct. gold or something like that. It comes from the fact that, that people want to, there's a demand to hold purchasing power in reserve to save value. And right. whatever the demand is, that gets, um, you know, it, it's like the, the value of any particular unit of gold is a function of the total demand in the economy to hold purchasing power in reserve to save uh, divided by the total amount of gold. Right. That, and so if you increase the amount of gold, all you're doing is just making every piece of gold worth a little bit less. Right. So you're redistributing that value. You're not creating any new. Uh, yeah. And you can see this in countries that have high inflation. You know, they just add a zero to their bill sometimes. And that doesn't make people 10 times as rich. It just redistributes it. The purchasing power well, um like uh, the turkish lira is is uh, one of my favorite examples is that they uh, they did a million to one redomin uh, redenomination where they took uh, one million old liras and overnight made it worth one new lira and uh, this did not decrease uh, you know everyone's uh, <laughs> everyone's cash holdings by by like uh, you know a million to uh, didn't remove uh, you know 999,999 right of of like everyone's um, savings, everything just continued on as if normal. There wasn't a massive deflationary event or anything like that. All they did was just redenominate it. Oh, I'm a bad host. I'm a, I'm professional. I didn't even explain who. But let's just interject this. Explain who you are, <laughs> what you do. <laughs> oh, okay. So uh, I'm Aaron Voisin. I uh, am founder of a uh, a Bitcoin wallet company. Uh, it used to be called Bread Wallet, and now it's called BRD. And uh, that's that's what I do for uh, for a job. I've been uh, really uh, uh, interested in uh, Austrian economics and, and hard money uh, economics uh, since around, I guess it was Ron Paul in 2008 that first introduced me to the idea. And I started, I thought it was kind of kooky at first. And I thought, well, I better, you know, I respect him enough to, to learn more about this. And then I kind of fell into the world of Austrian economics and just uh, became really fascinated with it, especially with the the global economic crisis that was happening uh, at the time and trying to understand what in the world was happening. And, uh, and then uh, when Bitcoin came out, um, I learned about it. I uh, became convinced that this was something that uh, had at least the potential to completely change the entire way that the global economy functions. And I became obsessed with it and, and fascinated by it and ended up um, uh, starting a, a Bitcoin company to try to uh, help um, you know, help that happen and, and help, uh, you know, participate in what I thought was going to be a super important development. Right. Okay. Should have done that in the beginning. Um, <laughs> uh, and you're, you're pretty libertarian too, right? Yeah. Um, uh, although you won't like to hear this, I'm kind of, uh, turned more, uh, mold buggy and right. recently, but, right. uh, but right. yes, uh, I've been uh, a libertarian for a long time. So, um, okay. Yeah. And we were at the Bitcoin conference in Miami together too. That was fun. Um, Okay, so the reason I was talking about this is the unique thing of gold is what what my idea is this uh, because it's not a good like other goods it doesn't it's not itself wealth it represents wealth it lets you obtain wealth like the whole basically everything's about consumer goods right so you want producer goods they're valuable because they can make consumer goods and you want money because it can help you obtain producer or consumer goods basically correct so yeah. It, what's money, unique? Money's not value in itself. It's just a, a representation of value. Yeah, um, and it, like you can't consume it. It doesn't. It doesn't help you <laughs> do anything except you know when you trade it to somebody else. And so. so it seems to me that there's a unique risk in holding your wealth uh, or your savings in cash because although it's liquid, which is good, and although it does appreciate if it's got a fixed supply, which is good, um, it appreciates in terms of purchasing power. That is. Um, it's it's uniquely it's got a unique uh, risk of being of you losing it because it's it's based upon a network effect, and so if if somehow, let's say Bitcoin was the world's money, 
And mm -hmm. so let's say number one, Bitcoin two comes along, it's improved, and for some reason people switch to it. Like people switch from AOL to other things, or they switch from CompuServe to AOL, or they switch from uh, MySpace to Facebook. Um, they switch from one network, or the, you know, from from one network to the other. Then it would just disappear. It, it could go to zero in value theoretically. Um, um, and so that, that is theoretically possible, but uh, and it I'll wouldn't just, be instant. Probably wouldn't be instant, but it's possible, right? It, it's certainly possible. I mean, there could be a you know a bug in the protocol or correct. Um, there could be a but, technical problem. There could be a crash. There could be a government crackdown, or there could be a, a replacement technology. Right? That could those, happen. Those are all possible, and that's why Bitcoin right now isn't the global reserve currency, right? Because it hasn't earned that uh, that that trust. right. To that level yet but 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 let's but see let's imagine 50 years from now bitcoin's the only one it's been it's been chugging along for 60 years um that risk would be lower but it's still not zero because there could you could still have a replacement you could have a crash you could have an alien invasion i don't know you could have meteor hit the internet wiped out um, it's never zero i mean like think about it like uh but but the way i think about it is like uh you know right now people just assume that the internet is going to be around like they're they're not like they're not worried that the internet is going to go away and no but but the, but they not but, but they might not put all of their wealth in it like they might bet they might not bet all of their wealth on the proposition it will never go down ever okay that's fair um, um and i'm not saying the risk would be high i just think it's categor categorically different than the risk so if i hold some of my wealth in apple stock there's a chance that it could crash too uh, or if I hold some of my wealth in real estate that I own, there's a chance that the value could go down. But it's a different type of risk than the risk of my money value going away uh, for network effects disappearing. Because the the land that I own is not going to disappear. So, uh, you know, well, the apple it, orchard that it, I own will not take, disappear. Yeah, it could be. It could burn down. Uh, <laughs> Correct. It could, but it won't. But it's a different type of risk than faced by. So all of, so my proposition to you is that I think that you know like so right now Bitcoin is appreciating in value um, because it's being adopted and so we're in this weird phase for I don't know the next ten years or however long it's going to take. Um, I was about the risk, I wanted to make the comment that risk is relative, right? What matters is that it's uh, less risky than the alternatives. That's what I mean. You're going to put your money in the safest place, and nothing is 100 percent, but you have to put it somewhere. Correct. But my point is, so right now, I think it makes like it makes sense to be a hodler and not to sell your Bitcoins because you're selling it low because it's going to go higher, according to us. <laughs> that's, um, that's what you think is going to happen, yes. <laughs> but it's still – you're taking a risk that it could crash on the way up, and then you could lose everything. But uh, so we're, we're taking the gamble that, okay, let's hold until it gets – it reaches the point of adoption. Now, when it reaches the point of adoption, presumably it won't be increasing in value 200% a year over year. It'll be 5% or something like that, right, when it finally reaches that point. So when we reach that Never point… Effects eventually hit like a, a saturation point. Correct. They, uh, they've saturated the, the market, and uh, we're, right. we're far from that in Bitcoin, but eventually uh, we'll hopefully get that far. So right now, if you're, if you're a greedy hodler, you're hoping – you're willing to take the risk of some kind of catastrophic crash because there's no other alternative out there. There's no other way to be part of this new system other than to sit and hold and wait. But once it finally reaches that saturation point… And it's now the money of the world and all that. Um, I think I personally, and I think other people would be thinking like me, you know, if I've got a million dollars in Bitcoin, I'd be worried that maybe it would, it, I would lose it all if there was a crash or if there was a replacement or if there was a government crackdown. So I don't need all of my money in cash and I can make my 5% returns in other ways. So I would take 95% of my money or 90%. And I would I would buy uh, index funds. I would buy Apple stock. I would buy Amazon stock. I might buy some bonds. Uh, I might buy some real estate. I might invest in my brother in law's pizza business. So I would make investments with the rest of it. And maybe you're right in your first point that I can't beat the market, but maybe I can get something similar. You know, uh, the the you know if I buy an index fund, it might be something similar to the deflationary returns of Bitcoin. So if I'm making five percent. On Bitcoin, I could also make roughly five percent from an index fund. Um, so, so the point that uh, that I was going to make uh, relative to that is that um, 
if a lot of people feel the same way, um, then what you're ha what you're going to end up with is uh, this monetary value, this uh, kind of demand to hold savings, uh, to hold uh, purchasing power in reserve, uh, is going to flow into these other markets uh, due to uh, you know people who think just like you that uh, you know this isn't safe and I want to put it somewhere else. I want to put that that somewhere else, and they're going to bid up the price of those assets. Um, so like the savings energy, this demand to hold purchasing power and reserve has to go somewhere. And there's a certain amount of it in the economy. And, um, you know, what typically happens with network effects is that you get one big winner and we're talking about, okay, if that becomes Bitcoin, then Bitcoin shoots up in value <laughs> and it becomes money. It has a monetary premium. Yes, it has. In, and hopefully it has, you know, nearly all the monetary premium. But the, what I'm saying is that there's a monetary premium a demand in the market. You mean in the market? You mean so. So let me let me let me be clear here for a second. So if we have gold as money, let's say the majority of gold's value is the monetary premium. Yes, but not all of it because it has some non-monetary uses. But Bitcoin basically has no use except for money. So. Basically, 100% of Bitcoin's value is its monetary premium. But what you're saying is that in the economy as a whole, that you want 100% of the monetary premium that's in the economy to be in the money of the economy. That's what you're saying, right? Um, that would be the uh, – that's kind of the, the natural tendency is for uh, – you know, because of network effects, kind of like uh, you know, we have one internet protocol because of network effects. We don't have all these other competing network protocols just disappeared. Um, I think that, right. that's what you'll eventually see with money. And if, if there's like a, a, a monetary kind of inflationary bubble, like in the stock market, I think that uh, you'll see people, uh, uh, you know, as Bitcoin becomes money, I think you'll see that bubble deflate. And Correct. I agree with all that. And real estate prices also, because people won't need to park their money there to get some returns. But still, so I might agree with you on your first point that you can't beat the market. I'm still not sure, but maybe you can't beat the market. But I still think you could approximate the market um, with an index fund. And I just – it's like everything I suggest, you want to you want to, you want to be one of these Bitcoiners who imagines a world where everyone except for certain specialists basically has all their savings in cash, and that's it. So – I, I, I would disagree with that characterization. So okay. um, what, uh, what I've said a few times uh, in, our, in our email discussion is that, um, uh, you know, I think it's certainly possible that the stock market as a whole could be worth, say, double, um, you know, all the Bitcoin in the world. Um, what matters is that um, is the, the returns that of these businesses, like when you, you buy a stock because uh, the company has earnings. And uh, the, uh, the time discounted future expected earnings of that, that uh, company is what, the, uh, is what the market cap of the stock should be worth. Um, well, so why? Why? Should be, should be why? According to modern finance theory? If, if you're not buying it uh, as uh, – like let's assume that all the savings energy, all the monetary premium is in Bitcoin – then why would somebody buy a stock? Well, they, they, why would they invest in a business? Well, it's because that business is going to have future earnings and they're uh, taking some chunk of capital now uh, to uh, buy that future earnings stream. Let, 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 me, let, me put, let me add something, see if you agree with this. Um, I had an argument in law school with a guy about this. Uh, like I was trying to argue, get down to the essence of what stock ownership means and why, why do stocks have a value? And uh, he fought me because he was a conventional thinker. But I basically said the only reason a stock has value is because of the ability to – the prospect of receiving dividends in the future. He said, and his answer is this stupid, uh, well, no, because lots of companies don't pay dividends and they have a value. I mean he missed the point, right? Um, well, so, um, so I, would, I would say that that's, uh, that's the, the, the way that it's – it would work in a hard money economy, but in an inflationary economy, um, it, basically you're you're kind of buying into an inflationary bubble. People buy stocks in order to speculate on the future price of stocks. Correct, correct. Stock, but 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 thing. but e even in an inflationary economy like ours, if you had a stock, joint stock company or, or a corporation, which 
had some kind of permanent inability or policy where you knew that they could never, ever, ever pay a dividend. Uh, and by that, I also include uh, the, the the value of the assets because the, like, uh, so to me, stock ownership has has three rights associated with it. Number one is the right to vote for directors if you have voting shares, um, which is not inherently worth anything. Um, and then the other two rights are, number one, the right to receive dividends on a pro rata basis if dividends are paid. So you don't have a right to get dividends, but if they're paid, the the, the, the company has to distribute them pro rata to all shareholders, right? Sure. And number two, if there's ever a winding up or a liquidation, like a sale, yes. then whatever yeah. assets are remaining get distributed pro rata. And you right. can think you of that final one. The, the company, yeah. What's that? You, you own a certain percentage of the assets of the company, so if they if they are sold, then then you get that. Yeah, I don't think I actually don't think it's, it's correct to say you own them um, in libertarian theory. I think because you can't control them, but you do have the right to get a payment um, based upon the sale of those assets in a winding up or a liquidation, which you can I, think of as a final dividend payment or a residual dividend payment. Yeah, might be. A- you know, uh, splitting hairs, but I guess I, if it's not actual ownership, then then the intention is to simulate ownership or something like that in using some kind of legal uh, framework. I um, when I say it's not ownership, it's because, you know, if you have uh, Google shares, you can't go you can't go use their headquarters for a birthday party. You can't fly their corporate jet. You don't you don't have the right to control those resources. Mm. All you have the right. All, the only right you have is the right to vote for the board of directors. Right. Yeah. Because the, you can, as a shareholder, you, uh, well, of course, when you buy in, you're agreeing to the, the you know, whatever the the agreement says. Um, yeah, I, we, we could get, it's not that important. Yeah. But, but, but the point is, so from a financial point of view, being a shareholder means you have the prospect of receiving money in the future. The money can be in the form of a dividend or like a final payment, which is the liquidation of the assets. Okay. So, but if you knew that a company could never pay you anything. It it would. I don't think the stock would have a value. Uh, it'd be a curiosity. It wouldn't have value even in an inflationary environment. So ultimately, the value of the stock in the stock market is based upon the the possibility of receiving a dividend. I'm actually agreeing with what you're saying. I just don't think people think of it in those terms. It's a way of explaining why things have value. They have value because they might result in a future uh, a future gain. Yeah. Um, so the I guess the the counter example would be something like the uh, the South Sea bubble, right? Where um, uh, people were um, pretty convinced that they would never get any uh, like for a while that they, they would never get the dividends and they would never get you know a- anything like what they were paying um, for the stock in assets uh, if the company were to be sold off or something like this, uh, but it was going up because it was going up. Uh, Correct. I, I think they were trying to trade. They were trying to trade on other speculation. But so you have these waves of up and down prices, but it's based upon a foundation. It has to have a value in the first place. And the value has to come from the possibility of receiving some kind of payment in the future. If the company was like there was a law passed saying no company, no ger- no German company can ever pay any shareholder a, a penny, and if when they were liquidated, uh, all the assets go to the government. I think the yeah, stock would have they would have literally zero value. Yes, I would agree with that. So anyway, so your argument is this one, which I, I'm having trouble. Or I don't want to believe it. Um, so what you're saying, I think, let me characterize it, and you tell me if I'm right. So your argument is this, and by the way, you say it so so certainly. Like I thought you were getting this from someone else, but as far as I understand, is this your own theory, or do you think others? Uh, it's. Um... So I, I think I, maybe I've uh, I, I thought about it and articulated it and maybe refined it a little more. But uh, I, I will say that, that this is uh, a lot of this comes from, um, you know, kind of uh, Curtis Yarvin's writing on, on you know, okay. the Bitcoin. And, uh, but this know, is he, not like standard conventional knowledge. This is sort of your take on it. But you seem to think it's pretty uncontroversial, too, even though it is pretty – Unique well, original. It's just how I present it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm 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 fairly confident that that I'm right, and I uh, you know I I feel confident that that I got this right. But uh, so here so here's what you so here's what here's what your theory is. So let's suppose, let's just imagine everyone's got all their money in, in Bitcoin. Okay, and some some people someone like me says, well, damn, I don't want to risk it for a, a network collapse. 
So I'm going to I'm going to buy uh, this index fund in the stock market. And even though I don't know anything about the stock market, uh, these specialist people are in there. <laughs> these stocks have a value. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to put half my money in in VTI. Um, and presumably it'll make about 5% returns too, on average. I won't beat the market, but it'll make about what the market makes. And so I'll be making roughly the same returns. It won't be as liquid, but I don't need that much liquidity. But if if Bitcoin crashes, at least I have my wealth will still be in, in, in the stock market and I won't, I won't be wiped out. Now, your so, argument is that if more and more people do that, then they yes. start – they have to – I guess basically there's an increase in demand to hold that stock – that comes not right. from not from the desire to get the future dividend stream, but in the desire to hold it as a store of value. So then you're artificially inflating the supply of that stock, which means it's basically in a bubble and it's going to pop someday. That's your right. idea. So like so what you said is like if I can get five percent, then I'll buy it. And that makes perfect sense. Of course you would. Uh, but the problem is that if a lot of people start doing that, you bid up the price, and then the return relative to the price is not going to be five percent anymore, right? It's going to be four percent, and then three percent, and then two percent. You know, as as the relative to the price that you paid. But but then but then that would affect it. Would you'd have a negative feedback that would automatically. I mean, and VTI would, I mean, there's the entire world outside of cash. There's everything. Every other asset other than cash is things you could invest in. You could invest in land. You could invest in uh, your own companies. You could, okay. you could, you could buy debt. Uh, you could do lots of things. You know, buy bonds. Um, you and buy all those things maybe would be worth, you know, like I said, like the stock market could be worth more than all the Bitcoin in the world. And the but what you're saying is, okay, so, so everything is worth more than, well, in a sense, everything has to be worth more than money because money is only worth what everything else is worth. In a sense, right? Uh, I would say, I would say that's that's actually not true. That's intuitive, but I don't think that's right. I think it's uh, it's worth the demand to hold purchasing power in reserve, which is different. Like uh, you can have like uh, let's say all the land in the world be worth five times or ten times all the money in the world. If there's, you know, if, if the land is productive, mm. and, uh, you know, and, and that money is, is cycling through, let's say. Oh, yeah, I see, I see what you mean. Yeah, I don't mean that it's worth. OK, yeah, you're right. Um, it's dumped all the land on the market at the same time, then it would have to be, only be worth all the money in the world. OK, but the point is, we imagine all the assets in the world, the entire earth, OK, all human assets, um, they're worth something. And what you're saying is when people start holding any of that in, in sort of a systematic way as a store of value, then you start pushing that 100% of purchasing of, – of, of monetary premium that was in the, the money system. You push it away from that, and you start making – you start diverging from the ideal, which is that all the monetary premium is in the money. And none of it is in the other assets. But if people start holding the other assets for a store of value, you start deviating from that and building a bubble, not in not in the index fund or not in Apple stock, but in everything in the world. Like the whole the whole world economy becomes a type of bubble that's that's unstable. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't think it happens uh, in in like where it's evenly distributed across everything. I just think. Uh, no, I'm that, not saying evenly, but still, as a general matter, compared to yeah. compared to the money, everything is in a bubble. Right. So, uh, what, the way it actually seems to play out in practice is that you you get uh, bubbles in particular asset classes first. It's not like evenly distributed. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, so it tends to focus where you you get okay. one asset going up and people are buying it because it's going up, and you get you get. Well, one. yeah, and let's take for simplicity. Let's just assume everyone puts it in DTI, an index fund. OK, mm -hmm. so everyone puts it in there. So that would be inflated and it would be not able to return enough dividends to justify the purchase price. That's what you're saying. Right. And, and um, then there would be people who, who notice that who maybe had the VTI before and they're sitting on gains. They're like, hey, I can get way more than what the dividend stream is worth by selling it right now. And I can get a big chunk of cash and I can trade that for some other assets, say real estate. 
And if a bunch of people start doing that, and then, you know, instead of holding the cash, they buy real estate instead, then you push up the real estate price. And then there, then people but, in real estate say, hey. But, but why couldn't this settle out instead of having a bubble? Why couldn't it just be a permanent sort of like people? So if you have excess income, right, you have savings, you have, you could hold some of it in cash, you could spend some of it, and you could invest some of it. Um, there's always going to be a proportion between those things. Partly, partly your interest, your time preference affects that, and partly your your desire to hold cash affects that as a relative. So you have these ratios, like so. Some of your wealth is in cash, some of it is in investments, non-cash investments, and some of it you, you consume, you you spend. Um, those ratios are always fluctuating. But why couldn't you have? Um, Everyone have a certain amount of risk aversion where they don't want to keep all their wealth in cash <laughs> because of this risk that I've identified, and so they would prefer to ha have half of their wealth in the stock market, even if they push a premium over there, meaning that the dividends won't be in. So, in other words, basically, I guess it would mean I make five percent from cash. Maybe I make three percent from from VTI because I've. I've depressed its ability to return, but I'd rather have three percent than five percent because the three percent is a hedge, basically. Why? Well, why is that? Why is that not possible? Well, well, I think I think it is possible. And what you're talking about are risk adjusted returns. Correct. If you Correct. See risk in Bitcoin, um, then Bitcoin will be worth you know less than one hundred percent of all the monetary uh, you know premium in the economy uh, by that by that level of perceived risk. But then um, that monetary uh, premium is going to have to go somewhere else. And uh, what you'll typically see, what, what, I, what I expect or what I believe happens is that um, if there's perceived risk in Bitcoin, then people will speculate on, well, okay, so Bitcoin collapsed, what would replace it? Yeah, but I, then, mean, I mean, I'm not talking about like some, some dangerous thing that should alarm us. I mean, Bitcoin is risky because nothing is not risky in the world. I mean… The risk will always be there. Don't you agree? Right, but what, what, what is the risk? The risk is that it collapses and something else becomes money. Correct. So then the speculation is it's not like a, just kind of this generalized risk. It's like a risk of something specific happening. And then, or, or, the, or, or a crashing, like the network crashing, okay. actually. And then we, we, for, okay. you know, we forget yeah. our relative uh, – you know, the, the whole point of these money holdings is to, is to have relative uh, – is to assign relative wealth among all the people on the earth. You know, someone who's got one bitcoin is ten times as rich as someone with one tenth of a bitcoin. Yeah, I, I, and so I, if if the network collapses, everyone's equalized again. So the rich, <laughs> so 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 it would be a wealth transfer is what what would happen, and people don't want that to happen. That have any that's like more than average. Club, but yeah, <laughs> and and so I I just don't understand why. So what what is your what, how would you if you had a guess as a science fiction writer uh -huh. what would it what would it look like so let's say you have some retired school teacher who saved up a million dollars worth of bitcoin or some retired truck driver who's got three million dollars worth of bitcoin I, would it uh, would most of these people have literally one hundred percent of their savings in cash all the time until they die is that what so you imagine? I would say that. Uh, no, I think there'll, there'll certainly be a mix. Um, and if somebody who's retired, maybe they have, uh, they're, they're feeling pretty secure and they have low time preference, let's say, right? Okay. They lower than average time preference. So if they have lower than average time preference, then um, the uh, time discounted returns of a stock or a piece of uh, you know rent property or something like this will be worth more to them than the time discounted uh, you know than the market average price for those time discounted returns. So give so, me an example. So give me an example. So you got some retired trucker, truck driver, and he's so got he three. Decides, he's got three million bucks. Where is right. it? Uh, so he's let's say he's been saving in Bitcoin, uh, and now he uh, looks at the stock market and says, "Hey, I can get." You know, uh, I can invest in Coca-Cola and uh, I can get these dividends paid out uh, and uh, the dividend stream uh, over, you know, uh, is worth more to me than this big than you know, <coughs> worth of Bitcoin. I can get, let's say, uh, let's say, you know, what you said, 5% or something per year. So I can get, uh, you know, what is that? Uh, 
250,000, uh, something like that uh, per year by investing a million dollars in Coca-Cola. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and do that and get that uh, and exchange, you know, a million dollars in Bitcoin right now for this dividend stream uh, of, you know, of fifty thousand uh, dollars worth of, uh, of Bitcoin per year, and uh, and uh, you know, if Coca-Cola doesn't grow at the same rate of the as the rest of the economy, then the value of that million dollars might start to go down, right? Like the value of the stock might start to go down. Um, and well, so I mean, so, so you envision people having a mix, which was all, my point all along. So I don't know if we disagree. So you, there would be a mix. So if if his time preference is lower than average. Well, but that's what I'm asking you. What would your typical retiree or I saver? Retirees in general. Or even right. savers, someone who's halfway through their career, they're saving. Where would they keep their savings? I'm asking, would they keep it all in cash or some of it in cash? That's what I'm asking. I think younger people uh, would, uh, you know, if I'm, I'm just thinking about this off the top of my head. My guess is that uh, older people who are retired have lower time preference than the average person who's like, let's say, in their in their 20s and trying to build wealth. Right. They're uh, people who are younger are going to be more willing to take higher risks. That so that's sense. low. That's low time preference. Wait, who's taking higher risk, the old people or the young people? No, the, the young people take higher risks to try so to. So that's, that's lower time preference, right? No, high time preference is when you want money, like you, you want to take a, a big risk to get lots of money right now. Like I, I, time preference, mm -hmm. I prefer having high time preferences, I prefer having more right now. So taking a risk is an example of high time preference? Um, yeah. Am I am I wrong about that? I think so. I don't know because if you're young, you tend you have a longer time horizon. You're willing to wait longer. Um, I don't know if it's a higher time, but but I guess I'm just so you're imagining you could have uh, lower time preference, but they I think in practice <laughs> younger people take risks. You know, they, it's just right. Human and I don't know if that, I don't know if that means high time preference to take risks. Um, I mean, it seems to me that basically what you're saying is. So if you're a saver, if you're in the middle of your career or if you're retired at the end, you're saying you you think you would have a mix. You would have some of your investment. But so here's what I understand. So you'd have a mix, right? You don't think people would have 99% of their stuff in, in Bitcoin all the time. Well, so uh, not necessarily, right? Uh, like what, what will happen is that um, – there's an average time preference uh, for like these investments that are, uh, you know, that have a return and um, maybe that return um, on like the stock market or renting out real estate, right? It's possible that all the stocks in the world or all the real estate in the world could be worth more than all the Bitcoin in the world. What matters is that once you hit that equilibrium where the time discounted returns is equal to the price, then everything after that is going to end up in money. Any, everything after that is going to end up in cash because it has to go somewhere. And if it goes into stock markets, then then you're going to reduce the returns of the stock market relative to the price of the stock. If right. it goes into real estate, then you reduce the rental income returns relative to the price of the property. And so people will stop doing that, and then they, they're going to search around. Where can I put it? Where can I put unless, it? Unless they're willing to take um... – have a risk adjusted return. In other words, they're willing to take a slightly less. So like the example you gave earlier, like uh, you take a million bucks and you buy Coca-Cola stock for the dividend. But I thought your earlier argument was that if people do that, then they're going to pump up the price artificially so that you won't be able to get your, your $50,000 dividends. It won't, we won't be able to justify that. So I don't well, see how so that's only remember I qualified it. I said he would only do that if he has lower than average time preference. Okay, well half the half the country is going to have have lower than average. So, you, so you're saying half the country would and, have and some of their wealth in Bitcoin, and the rest would be in, in basically investments. The people who have lower than average time preference will be the ones who are uh, purchasing these uh, these um, you know. Right, um, but right, but but if half the country that, does that, that's still an additional demand that's going to bid the price up higher than what it was before, and so it still won't be sustainable. Won't be able to give you fifty percent, fifty fifty thousand. Won't be able to give you your five percent returns. No, so uh, you're right. I think uh, well, it'll end up being where the the, the risk adjusted, time discounted future returns uh, on average end up being zero. Right, and when it hits that equilibrium point where it's like a toss up, do I put it in Bitcoin or okay. do I put it stocks 
and then that's when the price will stop going up for those stocks. Okay. So still, after all this, all this reasoning, let's say everything you've been saying is right. What's it look like? <laughs> Tell me what the world looks like. We have a bunch of we have Amer- America. We have a bunch of people that are saving well. Uh, we're prosperous. So you got some people with above average, some people less than. Uh, so uh, I uh, it, time preference. To, where where how is their money invested for their savings? What what do these investment advisors they recommend people do? Hey, keep ninety five percent of your stuff in Bitcoin. You don't have to hire me. Go away. Everyone keeps their money, or or is it well, like course, the, is the it like now? Advisors will say uh, you you want to trade it a lot, so I get fees. But uh, okay, <laughs> but, but um, what will they do? So I, I I might be uh, disappointing you a little bit, saying that I I don't know what it'll look like. But I think uh, what we ca- what we can know is what it will look like relative to where we are now with an inflationary economy. Okay, right, right now most people don't hold cash. Right, that's dumb. Why would you hold cash? You uh, you want to put all your money in uh, in stocks. And I stock agree. Market. They're chasing returns. I totally agree. And so I think what you'll see is that uh, most people, uh, at least a lot more. Well, let's say most is not the a lot more people than today will hold you know most of their savings in cash. No, um, that's only that's only settlers' paribus. That's only other things being equal. I agree with you that they would tend to. In that respect. On the other hand, what if everyone's 10 times as wealthy? Uh, what I think will happen is that the, like, like I said, the, the, this monetary demand that's currently being flushed into uh, these stock market bubbles and real estate bubbles, all of that value will end up in Bitcoin. Okay. Um, and so I think you'll see Bitcoin uh, becoming worth um, not just as much as gold, not just as much as, uh, you know, uh, the dollar and the yen and the euro, uh, but that it will be worth more than all the money, all the fiat, um, you know, uh, government money that's in the world today. I think Bitcoin will uh, consume all of that value and then on top of it, consume all of this uh, inflationary bubble value that's currently in the stock market and the real estate market. And other uh, these other um, kind of uh, investment assets that, that people are buying just to get out of out of uh, the dollar and the and the euro. But I think we have to compare like so. Imagine imagine someone today who has two hundred fifty thousand bucks because that's all they can save, and they they can't retire on that. So they're desperate to get some return. So they're 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 putting it into the stock market, right? They're desperate. Okay. Um, now, let's imagine the same person in a Bitcoin world, they might have saved $5 million because <laughs> the world's free market. Um, now they have $5 million. So number one, they don't need to put that money in the stock market to get returns because they can make 5% from cash. On the other hand, they have way more excess savings than they did. That will affect 50. their time preference, right? Well, it also might have, I mean, yeah, they might, they might say, well, hey, I can, I can afford to invest some of this in my brother-in-law's restaurant chain uh, and take a risk. Maybe they would, maybe they'd invest more in investments because they have more money. To, uh, what I'm saying is the, the, it's it, all these. So, so what I'm saying is that the desire to invest isn't going to increase the value of those investments. Uh, what, what determines the value of the investments is what kind of returns they generate. No, but it, it would affect how people hold their wealth. So I'm, I'm just trying to imagine. I, I just want to see, do you guys picture a world where everyone holds? Because this is what drives me nuts about Bitcoiners. They, they imagine everyone's holding basically all their wealth in Bitcoin. And you're saying you don't agree with that now, that you think people that have lower than average time preference won't do that. But so, well, so lower the, than average. Yeah. So that's the thing. Like, I personally, I I think that most people will just hold uh, like almost hundred percent of their of their savings in. So Bitcoin. you do. So you do think that. I, I do think that, but I can only justify. Like, and why would that, they, why would they not be worried about my concern about the market the, the money crashing? You think they would just think that's that's an unreal that's that's an un- unlikely yeah, risk. Think, I think it's just like do do people go around worrying about the internet crashing? I mean, maybe some do, and they're kind no, of no because their wealth is not dependent upon that though. Their their entire life savings is not dependent upon that not happening. I don't know. I think I I, I you just, know if the internet crashes, I assume within a week it'll be back up, and then I still have my house and I have my savings, and I can re- I can rebuild. But if 
if if if the internet crashes one time for for three hours and that means I lose everything, then I would want some insurance policy against the internet crashing. Sure, and and people who most people aren't going to think about it that deeply. They're just going to think everybody wants Bitcoin. I want Bitcoin. If it happens um, one time, they will. If it happens the uh, first yeah, time, they will. Sure. No, then I, they'll I, learn I, their lesson. I agree. Hey, remember that first digital currency we had, and it lasted for that, thirty years, be, and then everyone faster. got wiped out. I, I agree that 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 uh, if that happened then it would be a huge disaster and, and confidence in Bitcoin would be shaken. And then, you know, people would, would uh, you, you'd see alternative uh, monetary standards like gold, for instance, uh, shooting up no, in I value. Think, I think you'd have another one. You would just, you'd have Bitcoin too. It's just people would say, I'm just going to keep 10% of my wealth in Bitcoin. Sort of like with lightning right now. I mean, you know, if you have a, if you It'll have be a lot of risk, right? Like if, if they think there's a 90%, uh, you know, if they think the Bitcoin only has a 10% chance of being the, the ultimate successful money, then they'll keep 10% of their, you know, excess after, after, you know, finding all the investments they can find that make sense. Uh, they'll keep the, you know, the remaining 10% in Bitcoin only if they have 10% confidence in Bitcoin. So what I, here's what I think based upon all this. And I think that people would hold your average person would hold most of, a lot of their wealth in, in cash, but probably not more than 30%, something like that. That's my guess. And the rest would be in other investments. It all depends on, on those other investments, how much they're worth, <laughs> right? If they, they're not going to uh, And I think they would be worth rough, roughly the same as Bitcoin. I think they would be generating returns too. Um, it wouldn't be a science. So I think you'd have some money in, in, in index funds. You'd have some money in, in real estate. You'd have some money in your own business. Um, and I, you'd, I have a, you'd have a mix. You'd have a mix of assets. You'd have diversification, basically. I think you'd have people picking stocks uh, to yeah. add information to the market. Uh, but an index fund, would holding an index fund is like, in theory, it should have you know zero returns. It, would, it wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> well, then why does Bitcoin have it? Because holding cash is like holding the ultimate index fund. You're, yes, not adding, a- you're not adding information to the market when you hold cash, and yet you get 5% returns. And you're you're getting rewarded for that for uh, for, for what being from uh, consuming. <laughs> yeah, but if, uh, if I put money in 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 the in index fund, I'm re- I'm not consuming either. But you are you're you're uh, you're bidding up the price of those stocks, and uh, you're lowering the return that those stocks have relative to the price of the stock. Hmm. See, I think that I think that if you're right, there's something that some bright economist. Because uh, I don't think you want to do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather write code. Make yeah, it happen. <laughs> someone who writes, someone who knows how to write footnotes instead of code. <laughs> you, we need one of these bright young Austrians to to take this and run with it and figure this stuff out. Uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, there, there's definitely a, a huge lack of like, uh, at least I've never come across anything except for a few things that uh, you know Curtis Yarvin has written about. Uh, you know, thinking about what would a uh, a fixed money supply economy. Even right. Though. And this, this also plays out in this, in this issue of loans, which another thing I, I'm having trouble wrapping my head around, like how would interest rates in the loan market look in a fixed money supply world? And, and by the way, I, I also, I think you're right that this kind of wild speculation by amateurs would, would be cease. And the premium that real estate and these other things have now, because people have done that, to escape inflation would would go away, um, and I but I also think that in a in a Bitcoin world, a lot of our cultural and social habits would change because, it, you know, it's uh, oh yeah, it, it, time preference has been totally distorted and changed in people's habits. Absolutely. And I also I I I'm also almost of this kind of a I don't know this old fashioned view that credit would almost disappear like the entire the entire Consumer credit, definitely. And even business credit. I, I just tend to think, why would you have loans at all? The only thing I can think is you would have to have an interest rate for when someone has an involuntary debt. You know, If you run someone yeah. over with your car, then you owe them money and you can't pay them right away. You have to – you, you I have a de- something like, like, yeah. a, like a business bridge loan where like you have uh, – you need to borrow some money. Yeah, uh, factor, factoring you mean. Yeah, that, like you'd say, you've got some income coming in, but it's uh, it doesn't match up with your with your outgo. But uh, so I just think that money. people would just save yeah. up just save up enough capital to fund your own business. I mean, I don't. I, I maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me like. Go ahead. When we had a you know kind of a, a you know 
more of a well there was all kinds of issues why the gold standard wasn't actually like the real you know <laughs> wasn't what you'd think of as like a hard money gold standard uh, but in any case uh when you know inflation wasn't uh when they weren't printing money uh willy-nilly and it was somewhat tied to gold um you know you did tend to see uh you know things like 30-year mortgages like that that just didn't make sense that wasn't a thing you know uh that i don't think you'd see 30-year mortgages that doesn't make any sense at all why would you <laughs> oh i money? totally agree i totally agree with all that yeah all that's going to disappear um yeah i think that um uh, people i mean look money to buy a car they wouldn't they wouldn't get car loans you know correct I, I think people money. would i think you'd get out of college or whatever and you'd start earning a living and you would live in an apartment you pay rent and you'd save up money, and when you had enough money, you you just buy a house for cash, and you yes, live in the that, house. That's what that's what people and houses would cost a lot less. Correct, it would be worth what you could, you know, uh, whatever the 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 time discounted, you know, rental income stream would be worth. And you wouldn't have a you wouldn't have, people wouldn't be holding twenty thousand dollar Visa card credit all the time, debt uh, debt all the time. Um, Makes me kind of wonder, though, how these – because I've often thought that you have to have some kind of side change for payment systems for Bitcoin. So Lightning is one. I've always thought that pay, uh, the Visa or the MasterCard network could just sub, step in. But they only, they're only going to do that if they get interest payments, you know, uh, or I guess maybe they get fees from the, from the vendors. Yeah, they, they, get, they get transaction fees. So they, Because I think people would pay their Bitcoin balance off every month. They wouldn't be holding sure. a debt. <laughs> and and the, merchant, the merchant pays for that. that convenience, Correct. Right? They pay yeah, but they make money off of interest too So um, uh, because yeah. of the loans. Well, so the, the bank makes money off interest, but I think – the Visa network is literally just the payment network. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, the bank that issues the Visa card that they're they're the ones making the the, the money on the uh, on the interest on the loan. I believe I have to I have to double check that, but that's my understanding. Okay, I think my listeners are going to kill me if you don't give an answer to my question though before we go. So okay, how do you question. how do you pay? so take a take a take a uh, take a just a sample of say ten a representative sample of ten people in America like. Your 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 professional like doctor or lawyer who's got some money, your banker, your business owner, and your your you know your your retired school teacher and and welder, you know different levels of income, but they're all savings. Right now, they all have four hundred one ks and they have their money in the market. Right, that's what yeah, we have right now. My best guess is eight of those ten are going to have basically everything in Bitcoin. Uh, and maybe, you know, one or two of them are like gambling in the market and going to lose some money uh, trying to speculate in the okay. market. Okay. And then so the, uh, the other two are going to like purchase, uh, you know, uh, some some real estate or some stocks uh, for the dividend stream and the rental income. And uh, and, and then, the, you know, the, the first eight are just going to have everything in Bitcoin. Okay. So let's take let's take you for an example. Let me abstract a little bit to not make it too personal. Let's say you yourself or someone like you. 10 years from now, we're mostly a Bitcoin world. Let's say you got 10 million bucks, okay, <laughs> worth of worth of savings. Where would you have that yourself? Where do you think you would have that $10 million of Bitcoin? Let's say it's one Bitcoin. Where would you have that one that one Bitcoin worth of wealth? Would it be all in Bitcoin or what would you do with it? Well, I, I, I'll just preface this by saying I'm not a representative sample. Um, right, I'm I know, but you know yourself. Uh, I'm a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. I would be uh, either, a, you know, I would take... Probably um, half of it and keep it in Bitcoin, and the other half I would take, you know, some kind of crazy risk with and do like venture capital, <laughs> angel venture capital. But you'd be trying to beat the market. You would be trying to beat yeah. the market. I, I believe that I'm. Uh, I can. I could be. You know, I, I'd say I look at all the companies out there and I see how badly they're mismanaged, and I think I can. I can do better. Correct. Than that. Okay. All right. That's interesting. But for the for the part that you want to just save, you would you think you would just use Bitcoin for that? You wouldn't yeah. say I'll, I'll put. 25% in Bitcoin and 25% would be in VTI. No, no, no. I would put uh, everything I wanted to save in Bitcoin and then I would and then I would take some uh, the the other uh, you know I would I would go for some high risk high return uh, like venture type uh, investment or entrepreneurial activity because that's just I, I have a high risk okay. tolerance. That's that's what I do, and I think I'm better at it than average. <laughs> All right. Well, I think you've confirmed. I think my suspicion has been right though. The Bitcoiners do envisage envision a world where most people that are savers basically save in Bitcoin. And the reason they think that is because they discount the risk that I've identified, uh, and they also think that they're artificially investing in other things now, and that artificial aspect would go away, which I agree with that too. Um, uh, I want to. I think I touched on it briefly, but I wanted to reiterate. So uh, if there is perceived risk around Bitcoin, 
uh, that doesn't mean that uh, that uh, that that um, you know uh, that monetary premium that is not going into Bitcoin because of the perceived risk is going to be spread out evenly over uh, other assets. I think right. that it's going to end up being all the people who who are suspicious or doubtful of Bitcoin are going to have an, still a network effect and still an incentive to all standardize on some alternative, and that alternative then will have like a value maybe uh, one tenth of mm. Bitcoin. But yeah, and I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I agree with that. So what you're saying is, um, it, it'll be like silver and gold, right? You no, see, I understand. Yeah, yeah, but but the silver and gold thing happened because we had physical money and you needed small change. I don't. With, so here, here's what I would think. Based, well, I'm thinking what, more of like today that there's a lot of people who, uh, you know, are like libertarian hard money investors who don't who aren't putting their money in Bitcoin and believe in precious metals. Correct. And then, uh, you know, there's some subset of them who think, well, gold is being manipulated by Correct. Banks and stuff like this. And so I'm going to put my money in silver. Correct. And so all those people who don't trust gold for whatever reason. Correct. Uh, all have an incentive to standardize. No, I get it. Yeah, I get it. I still don't agree because so what you're but that's because silver and gold used to be money. So they have this money remnant. So they both have a monetary sure. premium perceived right well, now. So that, that creates what's called a, in game theory, a shelling point. It's like, OK. It doesn't matter what you pick as long as you all pick the same thing. Correct. And silver is the obvious choice yeah. because it's the you know it's yeah. the first thing to think of when you reject Correct. gold what's next silver. Yeah. So what what the way I interpret all this is according to your views, um, well, according to my view, there's always going to be a risk of Bitcoin because the the nature of money itself is is a risk because it's it's based on a network effect and that can always disappear. Okay, because it's not wealth yeah. itself. So money has an inherent risk that will never go away. And because of that, I don't think everyone will keep everything in money all the time because of that risk, which means there's I, all I agree, but I think it'll be a small fine. It'll be well, whatever the amount is that, that perceived risk, right? right. Which we, that perceived risk is gonna be very small. Uh, and you know, unless unless something happens to make people think, oh my god, this other thing is gonna replace Bitcoin, and then you'll see like all uh, a shift, value. right? Yeah. I agree with all that, but and I don't know what the percentage would be. I don't think it's quite as small as you think, but um, so I think that so because of the risk, you will always have Bitcoin, even if it's the dominant money, will never have 100% of this monetary premium you're imagining. There will always necessarily be some of that monetary premium, which will be distributed into the non monetary assets of the world. I agree with you, it won't be evenly distributed, but I don't think that means that there will be one other thing that will become a secondary shelling point type thing. Like a secondary, like a lingua franca or something. I don't think it will be. I don't think any particular asset necessarily needs to become the second main store of value. That's the the safe harbor from the perceived tiny risk of Bitcoin. I just think it would be a general thing where people would hold most of their stuff in cash, but they would keep some of it in basically other assets, and that would be just dependent upon their circumstances and their values and what they know. So some would be in the real stock market, some would be in index funds, some would be in particular stocks, some would be in in loans and bonds, some would be in real estate, some would be in other things. I just think it would be di distributed all over, and that would just be the permanent state of the world. In other words, Bitcoin would have 92% of the monetary premium and 8% would be of the rest of the world, something like that. that um, that's how I envision it. Yeah, I, I, I think that you're right that there you can never hit 100% exactly, right? So it, it, all, all I will say is that it will approach hundred <laughs> percent. I don't know. I don't right. think it will approach it. I think it'll approach something less than hundred because the risk is there's always a real risk of this of this special this special good, the special monetary network. So it won't approach it might approach ninety eight percent, but it won't approach hundred. I, I just I think that that's uh, you know you grew up uh, before the internet and before right. this stuff and and like maybe for our generation that'll be the case. Right. Um, um, it's kind of like, uh, you know, like the old guys who like, uh, were holding gold and they didn't trust this, this, right. bank, you know, paper bank money. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Like, yeah, like, yeah. But I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying I have a special distrust of Bitcoin or I think it's in a special risk. I'm saying that money itself by being a non-wealth, like it's not wealth itself and it's based upon a network effect. Um, it has a unique risk, and that is it could collapse and and erase everyone's relative holdings. That could I, happen. I agree that that risk is not zero. Correct. But, That's all uh, I'm saying. <laughs> yes. And, I and, and with the technological that. digital money, the risk is even higher in a perceived way than for – I don't know. I think so like – so for instance, gold, right? The, the risk 
uh, the personal risk with gold is confiscation. Correct. Right. You could get robbed. You could like the, so that's a risk. Uh, Correct. You know, you're not worried about like, you know, the, whatever the, the, the fundamental properties of physics changing and having the gold, you know, uh, you know, decay or something like this. Um, but, uh, but you could uh, be worried about technological innovation and someone be, yeah, being able to, to make gold in a cheap way. Yeah, oh, there you go. That's a, that's a great example. Yeah. Like what if, uh, what if they, you know, get, nuclear fusion working and then they can just extract gold from seawater right right and then, and then all of a sudden your gold is worthless so that that is a risk right and the risk is not zero and uh, so to hedge against that risk you're going to uh maybe maybe you believe in gold that it's going to become this uh going to retake its position as the global monetary standard uh but you know just to hedge against these technological risks you buy a little bit of bitcoin just in case that kind of thing yeah okay um, I think that's enough <laughs> for, yeah. food for thought. And I just want, I want some bright young Austrians to go figure all this out. Okay. Okay, cool. That's your task. All right. Uh, anything else? Well, now before we go, uh, so, uh, what's your handle on your handle on, uh, Twitter is Voisin, right? Yeah. Just my last name. V O I S I N E. How'd you get that? Um, I was early. <laughs> <laughs> How early? How early? Like, uh, I don't know. I guess you could look at my first. I think it was like two thousand seven or eight. Or I was. I, I think I was around six. I was pretty early, but um, yeah. I have a unique enough last name that usually I right. have been able to to get that that uh, that handle on most uh, tech uh, kind of social media platforms because uh, I'm also a techie, and so I tend to you know be earlier to these things than than most people. So. And what's your position at, at BRD at Bread Wallet? Uh, I am founder and president. And you want to give a plug for it here before we go? Uh, yeah, it's just a brd.com. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great uh, cryptocurrency uh, wallet app. So uh, we're closing in on uh, 10 million users. So I'm pretty excited about that. All right. Well, thanks for chatting with me today. Anything else you want to add before we go? Uh, I think that's it. Uh, great talking to you. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. All right. <laughs>